All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. It's uh, three o'clock Eastern. Um, so we're very delighted today to have as our speaker, uh, Linda Young. Uh, so Linda is a distinguished fellow at Argonne National Laboratory where she currently leads the Atomic Molecular and Optical Physics Group. Um, and she's also a professor part-time at the Department of Physics and the James Frank Institute at the University of Chicago. Uh, Linda obtained her PhD from the University of California at Berkeley, um, and she did her postdoctoral studies at the University of Chicago um, before uh, joining the physics division at Argonne. Um, Linda has been honored as a fellow of the APS um, and also, also as a distinguished lecturer for the um, APS division of laser science, among many other honors. Um, so before she gets started, I just would like to remind uh, all of our viewers um, to ask questions via the Q&A. We will have breaks for questions during the talk. Um, and you can also ask questions through the YouTube chat feature. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Linda, and I look forward to your talk. Great, thank you, Michael. Um, and thank uh, the committee for the invitation. Um, let's see, you see my screen now? Yep, I can see it. Okay, we're doing well here? Yep. All righty, all righty. All right, so um, today my, my topic will be, as you can see here, stimulated X-ray Raman spectroscopy with X-ray uh, free electron lasers. Um, I understand that this is probably not the mainstream of all the panelists here, nor of the audience. <laughs> so I'm going to go through a little bit of uh, explanation on each of the elements of this, um, uh, of this talk. Um, depicted over here on the right uh, is a picture of, of what we actually uh, hope to use, the, the, the scheme we hope to use, such that we can actually capture um, snapshots of chemical reactions uh, in, um, in action on a site-specific basis in complex systems. And so what you see over here on the right is, oh, a free electron laser comes into a gas. Um, it interacts with the gas and the propagated um, radiation that comes out carries imprints um, on this very fast time scale given by the uh, pulse duration of the X-ray free electron laser of what's happening in, in that gas. Uh, so so there, there's basically three elements that you probably are sort of familiar with uh, being from AMO. Uh, one is X-rays, one is Raman spectroscopy, one is X-ray free electron lasers. And so let's just kind of go through those uh, um, you know, quickly. Now, this is no good. Why doesn't my thing advance? Ah, there we go. Okay, x-rays. <laughs> we all know about x-rays, right? Um, they were discovered in 1895 by uh, William Conrad Röntgen. Um, and uh, depicted here is a picture of his wife's hand with a ring on it, very famous uh, picture. And just a few years later, uh, this discovery was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, actually the very first Nobel Prize in physics ever, uh, in recognition of the extraordinary services he has rendered by the discoverer of the remarkable rays subsequently named after him. So, you know, this is, this is kind of just a, just a little interesting um, tidbit. Um, but of course, x-rays ha have come a long way since that point in time, and they're basically ubiquitous uh, in society now. Um, it's a, they're a supremely versatile tool to characterize matter. Um, X-rays are typically defined uh, as shown on, on this plot from David Atwood's book um, as ranging from the carbon K edge at around 270 EV um, up farther. And there's this little region of soft X-rays and then so-called hard X-rays about an angstrom, which, which depicts the distance between atoms in, in molecules and solids. But it's proper, their, their properties are really cool because you can penetrate visibly opaque objects like, like uh, uh, Röntgen's wife's hand and, and your body and so on. But because the wavelength is so short, you can see many smaller features. You can write smaller patterns for engineering applications. 
because uh, the X-rays are very uh, selective in terms of the spectroscopy of all the different atomic shells. You have elemental, chemical, and magnetic sensitivity to inside your materials. And because of the very short wavelength and, and um, you know, reasonably high flux that you can get these days, you can have diffraction-based imaging on the atomic length scale. And you can get um, you know, macromolecular uh, structures uh, via crystallography. So now let's, okay, so now you know x-rays, right? And Ramon, Ramon has also this very long history, right? It was discovered in 1928, and even faster than the x-rays, they were awarded a Nobel Prize in 1930. Here's a picture of C.V. Ramon, the discoverer, and uh, the nature paper that was sort of associated with the discovery, uh, which was entitled actually The Negative Absorption of Radiation. What this, this actually shows is um, Ramon uh, spectra of liquid benzene, uh, taken with uh, a mercury lamp that's shown here with these uh, lines here in the middle. And then these arrows on the side are these new radiations that come from Raman scattering from the liquid benzene. And so over here on the right, you see all the Stokes lines. And over here on the left are the anti-Stokes lines, which are sort of considered negative absorption of radiation. And his Nobel Prize was for his work on scattering of light and for the discovery of the effect named after him. It's interesting how all these early folks get effects named after them, right? <laughs> so, so now what? 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 Uh, it this also ha has become quite ubiquitous in science and and various applications uh, because Raman spectra are, give a spectral fingerprint for chemical sensing, biological imaging, materials characterization. This is the typical thing I think you're very familiar with where you can have the elastic or Rayleigh scattering and you can have uh, the stokes raman scattering, which encodes basically vibrational energy level differences and anti-Stokes coming from an excited vibrational state. But just like in that picture I showed you before, the spontaneous Raman scattering is super weak. It's something on the order of 10 to the minus eight or so. Oops. And so if, if to make many of these um, um, sensors more, more robust, there are coherent Raman spectroscopies that have, that have come with the advent of lasers. So there's the coherent anti-Stokes Raman scattering stimulated uh, the femtosecond stimulated Raman scattering, surface enhanced Raman, et cetera, et cetera. So these, these are also ubiquitous in, in, many, in many scientific applications. Okay, so now, now we, we should look at um, X-ray Raman. So how about, you know, in optical Raman, you're typically, you're, you're getting information on vibrational um, energy levels in your complex systems. They make real nice fingerprints for, for different types of compounds. In X-ray Raman, um, as shown on this slide, uh, you can see it also has some very, it has similar features that encode instead of vibrational um, energy levels, electronic energy levels. So shown here on the left is X-ray absorption spectroscopy, where you are promoting an electron from a, a deeper inner shell out into you know, various unoccupied bands, maybe even to the continuum. X-ray emission spectroscopy, where if you've made a core hole in one of your inner shells, you can actually have radiation coming down. This would be like, um, K-alpha or Lyman-alpha type radiation. But when you're looking at Raman spectroscopy, or in this case, resonant X-ray Raman spectroscopy, you can use your X-ray to excite into some unoccupied level and then um, have an emission from a different occupied level such that the initial state, of course, the ground state, but the final state here does not have a hole in this deep inner shell. What this allows it you to do is to have, you've now eliminated the core hole broadening that you would usually have. And this core hole broadening can be quite large on the order of an EV or so. And this would really compromise your ability to be able to uh, look at different electronic energy levels in, in different systems. Okay, so if you wanna look at how an X-ray Raman spectrum looks like, um, that's what's shown here. This is um, looking at the X-ray Raman spectrum for for an argon atom where you, you promote a 1s electron out into the Rydberg levels, 4p, 5p, and then out into the continuum. So when you scan, um, as, as shown here, kind of up this, uh, up this 
uh, up this uh, coordinate, you can look at the emission H, H uh, bar omega two um, as, as you're scanning. And so when you see a Raman um, uh, scattering, it, it, it has various features associated with it. So you can see that you can have this dispersion that you expect from all Raman scattering. And then you can actually also have the subnatural line width that I, that I mentioned before. The, the line width for this argon 1s core hole is on the order of an EV. But if you have a very um, high resolution spectrometer, you can get down to like 0.01 EV or so. And so, and, and so you can see very narrow lines. If you have your spectrometer have a little bit more um, or less resolution, then, then you can see uh, these, other, these other features. And then again, even, even longer. So you see basically that you can have the anomalous dispersion, this diagonal line, subnatural line width, and also you have resonant enhancement. So when you actually hit the resonance, you get much more of this, of this scattering. Okay, so with if you have this spontaneous Raman scattering, you can actually look at um, various electronic structure features. And so here you see the, the 1s to 4p, and then you can see a hint of the 1s to 5p here when you have a very good spectrometer. Okay, now the third component, the th X-ray electron laser. We're gonna put them all together, don't worry. It's not just all little tidbits here. So this uh, free electron laser was first conceived in 1970. It was conceived by John Mady, shown here in the bottom right in his PhD thesis at Stanford in 1970. Um, and the, the abstract from that paper is uh, show, shown here. Um, and uh, the first operation of this was actually not in the X-ray, of course, it was actually in the infrared in a low gain mode uh, at, at the end of his thesis. And it took, you know, some some many years uh, before this was translated into the soft X-ray region in a high gain mode. This was done at Flash in in Germany at Daisy, and the first hard X-ray FEL in two thousand nine, also operating in this high gain mode, was at LCLS at Slack, and and uh, this is the first one that really got into the angstrom region of um, of operation and. It, and now there are like seven of these X-ray FELs in user operation and, and, and others are planned. And these are like non-trivial uh, undertakings, um, but uh, some of us are fortunate enough to be able to go there and actually use these phenomenal uh, devices. So what is this X-ray free electron laser? Well, it's like 10 to the 10 times more intense than any other laboratory source of X-rays. What it gives you are uh, femtosecond pulses, millijoule energies, angstrom wavelengths, and focused intensities up to 10 to the 20 watts per square centimeter. So these are these are kind of extreme in 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 many ways. Um, how does it work? Okay, so most of them are working by this self-amplified spontaneous emission mode where basically what you have are relativistic electrons injected into this periodic magnetic field, which is called an undulator, if any of you know about <laughs> these things or have seen them. But basically, um, because of this uh, relativistic contraction of the emitted radiation um, uh, in, in the undulator, you actually are changing um, the period at which these uh, these magnetic, um, well, the undulators have magnetic arrays with periods on the order of centimeters or so, but because of this relativistic contraction and Doppler shifting, you're getting this boost of uh, two gamma squared. And that turns things that, that are in the laboratory centimeters in, in, in length down to angstroms. Uh, for, for the emitted X-rays. So when these electrons are going through this uh, periodic array, they are emitting radiation at every turn, and the electrons actually interact with the emitted radiation. And this leads to a longitudinal uh, charge density modulation um, with a period that's equal to this uh, wavelength that's being emitted. And then as it goes down this super long undulator, you're getting increasingly coherent emission from the micro bunches that are being formed. So by the time you get to the end of this long undulator, you have a coherent emission from the electrons at this radiated 
radiating uh, wavelength. So this is uh, the LCLS. This is the very first um, uh, X-ray free electron laser that operates at angstrom wavelengths. Um, this was proposed by Claudio Pellegrini in 1992. It's something to use that slack linear accelerator for since it was no longer so interesting for high energy physicists because it could only go to 50 GeV and they were kind of into the TeV type range already. So what it uses is uh, the last third of an existing LINAC, which is a, a kilometer long. Um, the injection point was up here at uh, two kilometers. Those electrons were accelerated up to energies that are uh, between 14 and four GeV. It would then be transferred somewhere and go into this undulator, which is 130 meters long. So, you know, your, your gain medium is 130 meters long. <laughs> and eventually you get your x-rays out. Um, and it goes to two different uh, experimental halls, the near experimental hall, uh, where soft X-ray experiments are typically done, and the far experimental hall, where, where there are another three end stations for hard X-ray experiments. This is actually uh, a huge collaboration with many different national labs, and um, um, and Argon, I, I'm, I'm proud to say, actually made the first set of undulators that, that were used for this, um, uh, for, for, this, for this device. There are new ones now. And it has unprecedented intensity. And this is something um, that, uh, that Michael Cheney will appreciate. <laughs> Uh, because here, okay, so what, what, are, what are we looking at here? So this is uh, the peak brilliance, uh, which is the photons per second, per milliradian squared, per millimeter squared, per 0.1% bandwidth. Um, and, uh, and over here are um, the lasers, uh, the high harmonic uh, sources um, and, and others. And, and here um, in the gray uh, toward the bottom are the synchrotron radiation sources. And, and you can see there are these, there's this huge nine orders of magnitude uh, difference, uh, primarily because uh, you get one trillion photons in a bunch that lasts some tens of femtoseconds, as opposed to getting that one trillion photons coming over one second as you would have in, in, in a synchrotron. So it has unprecedented intensity, but the temporal and, character and, and spectral characteristics of these pulses is not is not as um, is not as what you folks would like in your normal laser labs, right? It, it's not what you use to you know cool atoms or or do spectroscopy or whatever, right? So so temporally you have many spikes, spectrally you have many spikes because you're amplifying spontaneous emission. So you're starting from noise and you end with noise. Um, uh, the uh, bandwidth uh, is controlled by this uh, so-called uh, FEL parameter, you know, which might be on the order of 10 to the 3. The spike, uh, the width of each spike is, is, um, is given by this expression. And so you have many, many spikes inside each of these pulses, right? So you can see here that this particular, where is my pointer now? Your pointer. The, this particular uh, pulse might have, you know, hundreds of, of uh, temporal spikes and, and equally a, a number of spectral spikes. Okay, so now I'm going to take a break. All, all I did was tell you about the three elements associated with what we want to do, because I figured you weren't uh, maybe so familiar with each of these. So, so I'm breaking here. Do all right, so we do have a few questions. Yeah. Um, so the first question is, what is the directionality of the emitted radiation from an undulator? Is it collimated or is it more dispersed? Ah, okay. So the emission from an undulator is given by the relativistic gamma parameter. Um, so it, it so it, so typically gamma is a very large number because the electrons are going maybe at, uh, let's say, 7 GeV. Right, and so then it would be that times two thousand, so that'd be a, a factor of fourteen thousand. So it's very, very collimated, um, and um, and so for the FELs, it's actually microradiance, which is pretty small, right? <laughs> um, and it's similarly small for um, 
the uh, the synchrotrons because it has that same gamma factor associated with it. Mm -hmm. Um, how is the frequency of the FEL tuned and how easy or difficult is it to do that? Ah, this is an excellent question. And those machine physicists have been worrying about this and spending lots of money on this for some time. <laughs> there are two ways, right? Because the radiation that's coming from the undulators is either given by the gamma uh, factor, the relativistic factor. So you can either change the energy of the electrons or you can change um, the magnetic field that, that the electrons are going through. And that you can change by actually changing the gap in the undulators. And so, so, you know, at synchrotrons, the undulators are only maybe two or three meters long, but at the FELs, the undulators are hundreds of meters long. And so it's a little bit tricky to, to change all the undulators simultaneously and keep it lazing. But those are the two ways. Either you change the undulator gap or you change the electron energy. But you can scan over a very large range. It's actually quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and so you show these quite complicated spectral shapes and temporal shapes. Is it possible to actually measure that kind of structure on a shot-by-shot -shot basis? And if so, how would, how would that be done? This is also a very interesting question. <laughs> we worry about this quite a bit. Um, so you can measure the spectral uh, spikes pretty easily if you have a good spectrometer. Um, and so we've done that. And so if you have a spectrometer with maybe part in 10,000 type resolution, you can see each of these individual spikes and that can give you at least the measurement in the um, uh, spectral domain uh, of the spikes. The temporal domain is quite a bit trickier. Um, people have measured uh, pulse uh, durations of single spikes using very fancy, well, they're kind of AMO techniques, right? Um, so you can have um, a streaking where you have a photoelectron that interacts with a laser field that's synchronized to the X-ray field. And you can, uh, you can look at the change in the emitted um, uh, dipole that 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 you get due to the added added um, streaking field that that you've added on to the photoelectron. So that in this manner, people have been able, particularly um, the folks at LCLS, uh, James Cryan and, and company, have been able to measure pulse durations of single out of second pulses. So you can see a dipole being, you know, normally you have dipole radiation when you do photoionization from an atom, but you can actually push this, this dipole up and around depending on the phase of the um, imposed IR field on, on, the, um, uh, on the emitted photoelectron. Mm -hmm. um, and then one last question before we go on to the rest of the talk. Um, so if you think about like the analogy to an optical laser, um, you know, you, you use a, a resonator cavity to create a single mode or a single frequency. Is there mm -hmm. anything like this for the X-ray range? Another excellent question. <laughs> this, this is actually under development. It's actually a dream. It's called an XFELO, XFEL oscillator. This is a dream of a colleague of mine, Kwon Jae Kim at Argonne in Chicago. And okay, so what's the problem with x-rays? The problem with x-rays is you don't have mirrors that work very easily, right? However, you can have Bragg reflectors that can actually reflect at some reasonable angle as opposed to whatever, two milliradians, right? And so you can actually build an oscillator that um, has as its gain medium, you know, this long undulator array um, and uh, put these, Bragg reflectors at um, uh, at the ends, and and you can make it tunable if you know if you have the right tuning mirrors and whatnot. But you can imagine that uh, the requirements on such an oscillator are pretty <laughs> stringent <laughs> because now you're in the X-ray range. Um, but there are actually some nice papers um, out uh, on it. Um, not so not so long ago, I think if you look up Kwon Jae Kim somewhere in Google Scholar, you'll find all these things. 
Um, and there's actually a demonstration that's being looked at now at, um, uh, at uh, LCLS to do it, but, but the entire, okay, so, so a cavity of a normal laser fits on a table easily, right? But the cavity of this, this thing is like, the test cavity is like 60 meters long. So this is like a non-trivial thing also. <laughs> I see. It's, right. it's lots of, it's lots of uh, precision engineering. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> All right, um, so you can continue with the talk and Okay. The next break. Okay. So now, so now you've heard about all these funny technical things that you guys don't usually worry about, but they're interesting anyway. Interesting for physicists. Okay. So, so what we want to do is we want to see if we can do this X-ray Ramon spectroscopy. Um, and I, I wanted to mention that you know the theory actually for this it really preceded the advent of X-Fels and really continues vigorously to this day. Um, so this was one of the first papers associated um, with the uh, coherent X-ray Ramon spectroscopy by Sean Mukamel, who's the person who's really been pushing this. Of course, he's quite the expert on nonlinear spectroscopies in the optical regime. Um, and uh, the, at this point in time, in 2002, there was no LCLS, right? At this point in time, there was lots of um, uh, high harmonic sources and there were synchrotron sources. And so he wasn't even thinking about free electron lasers at this point, but you know, the theory is it, it works anyway. And so, um, you know, here you could look at the entire manifold of electronic states by having a broad bandwidth to look at everything. Um, and and there are many other things that that uh, that are in in many different um, um, publications. The one I want to tell you about today, a little bit more in detail, is looking at this uh, direct observation of valence energy transfer between atoms in a molecule. This is what one might use the stimulated X-ray Raman for in in a in a simple case. Um, in this case. Uh, what what uh, he calculated was, oh, well, maybe we can make this a real-time movie of electron flow in a complex molecule. This is um, some kind of blue protein where if you excite on one end of it here shown as a rhenium, it makes a hole here in, in the rhenium uh, side and you get an electron transfer that goes from this copper side through this chlorine side and then eventually down to, to, to its, its home in, in the rhenium. And he calculated that you could probe these valence excitations you know, through X-ray Raman scattering and by doing so, you can co combine the spatial selectivity of the X-ray spectroscopy with these narrower alignments because we no longer have this core hole problem. And what is shown here are some of these uh, stimulated X-ray Raman spectra for the um, you know, for rhenium, chlorine, and, and 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 copper sites. And the attosecond pulses weren't really necessary, but the associated broad bandwidth was. Um, the directionality of the um, stimulated X-ray Ramon uh, enhances the signal compared to that spontaneous Ramon, and this is one. This was one of the ways that he suggested that you could do this, right? So you can have a, an activation pulse that starts the whole process, and then you have these two Ramon pulses, just like you do in multi-dimensional Ramon in the optical. Uh, you scan the time delay over some range that's sufficient to get the required energy resolution. And, and then you Fourier transform to get your site-specific um, spectral snapshots. And so he calculated for 100 out of second X-ray Vermont probes. Well, we don't have 100 out of second X-rays <laughs> from the FEL yet. I know you guys have them for the high harmonics at you know, even sub-100 out of seconds, but, but they aren't there quite yet. And these edges are not in the soft X-ray range. They, you know, these are actually in the hard X-ray range. Um, and there was another method that he, he proposed to do, rather than having the two out of second pulses um, separated in time where you have to scan the time delay, he said, oh, well, instead we can do a dispersed um, um, transmitted spectrum of a broadband, narrowband pulse pair. Um, and then this electron transfer reaction that takes place over you know, a long time relative to the pulse duration of your, of your X-rays, like 10 picoseconds, one nanosecond, 200 nanoseconds. Um, you could actually look, you could actually collect this in the frequency domain. And so this actually has a direct analog 
in um, optical studies. Maybe some of you are familiar with the femtosecond stimulated Raman scattering pioneered by Rich Matthies um, and, and co-workers. Again, you have this uh, um, uh, activation pulse, and then you have this wave packet in the excited state, which gets probed by two Raman pulses, one long Raman pulse, one short Raman pulse. And by using dispersed energy detection, you can disentangle the energy and time resolution and even beat the Heisenberg limit. And so it's very cool and it's been used for, for many things. So this is very inspiring. So, oh, well, you know, maybe one can do that. But the one thing, this, this is kind of advanced, right? I, I showed you what the, the, the actual <laughs> X-ray pulses coming from the free electron laser look like. And, and okay, so maybe that's a little bit difficult. We don't have 100 out of second pulse. They aren't coherent with each other. We, it's very hard to generate. So why don't we just go back and do standard, spontaneous Raman scattering um, using the XFEL pulses. And then we can get these spectral snapshots. All we have to do is we have to make very narrow band X-ray radiation. So we have to filter out a bunch of, of the radiation coming from the SASE, and we have to collect with very high resolution. And so this is what's actually being done. And, and this is uh, shown at, or planned to be done. <laughs> This is uh, LCLS, um, and they have something called the QRIX and the ChemRIX end station, which is brand new and about to be fed by um, the brand new high rep rate uh, LCLS2. Um, and this whole, this whole apparatus is on the order of um, uh, maybe 20 meters long or so. So it's quite, quite the... Um, uh, quite the engineering marvel. Um, here, the spectral resolution is set by the photon bandwidth. So you don't take the whole FEL pulse, you take a little bit of the FEL pulse through a monochromator. The temporal resolution, of course, is set by pulse durations and jitter. And But once again, because we're looking at spontaneous Raman, the collection detection efficiency is kind of slow, right? It's kind of low. But, but it's uh, very powerful because you can go over a very large energy range. Um, and, and, and you have quite a few things that you can tailor to for, for your particular experiment. But we were wondering, oh, well, you know, maybe there's another way. Maybe we can use the entire ugly sassy pulse for something, right? Because the sassy pulse has, is, is a, a set of randomly phased, independent, narrowband frequency components confined within the pulse duration. Um, and then maybe there's some way we could amplify the weak spontaneous Raman signal, okay? So the answer to these two questions is yes, we can use the entire SASE pulse and yes, we can amplify the weak spontaneous Raman signal. So, so how, how, how are we gonna do this? Well, well, we build upon things that people have done. Um, oh, before we do that, let me, let me just say, um, okay, so let's take a look at two SASE pulses. Um, so we, we can look at, uh, here we are. We can look at two SASE pulses that have both 70 uh, bandwidth. We can look at a 40 femtosecond pulse on top and a four femtosecond pulse on the bottom. Uh, the temporal coherence or spike width is given basically by the bandwidth. So the spike width for a 70 V bandwidth is on the order of uh, 0.17 femtoseconds. Um, and the, uh, the spectral spike width, the, the spectral coherence, uh, for the 40 femtosecond pulse is on the order of, you know, 0.1 EV. It's one, it's inversely proportional to the pulse duration. And for a four femtosecond pulse, only around one EV. And so now we're getting, so you can see the advantage of having actually a longer pulse, but having a 40 femtosecond pulse to look at these things that are happening on, you know, longer time scales is not so bad, right? So, so it's an advantage to a longer pulse. This is actually interesting been been shown to be useful uh, to use the full you know noisy spectrum of a laser in the optical regime uh, in this in this paper by Tallerud, uh in uh, 2017 um, and so basically they had a nice laser but they generated a bunch of noise onto the laser. <laughs> They measured the incident spectrum and um, the spectrum through the sample, and they could collect um, and, and 
uh, and analyzed via um, the covariance between the two, which is basically this expression of um, the omega-1 versus omega-2 minus the average of the two, you could actually collect these spontaneous Ramon spectra associated with that. And so interestingly, in this particular paper, they go, oh, importantly, the framework used here to reveal uh, stimulated Raman scattering to be generalized to other nonlinear optical techniques based upon tabletop and FEL sources. And the FELs pose a particularly attractive possibility because they function on self-amplified spontaneous emission, which intrinsically leads to noisy pulses, optimally suited to covariance-based techniques. So if you're, oh, well, okay, we can use all of the, um, um, all of these individual pulses, and we can use covariance techniques to actually pull out stuff. Um, now, can we amplify stuff? And yes, we can amplify um, the emission as well. Uh, what, was, what was shown here is a demonstration very early on of an x-ray laser um, at, uh, at LCLS by Nina Roeringer and her colleagues. Basically, you have the x fell coming in to a little gas cell, and you take a look at what, what comes out on the other end into a spectrometer. If you're way above the uh, above the 1s edge for for the um, for the neon uh, to liberate a, a 1s electron from neon, you can create a population inversion in this in this tube of um, uh, of neon that that you've excited and that spontaneous emission in the beginning of the um, uh, of the cell can be amplified on the way out. And that's what's shown shown over here. So you can see the input uh, x fell pulses um, uh, have this very noisy SASE spectrum, but the atomic X-ray laser, of course, lasers on the atomic transition. You're amplifying that spontaneous uh, emission of the 1s to 2p in the neon ion. You can, they also were able to see how it amplified as a function of, of pulse energy, and there was an exponential gain of this amplified spontaneous emission. So that, that's for spontaneous emission, but it also works for Raman scattering. When they went down near the edge, as opposed to way above the edge, you could actually take a look. So neon, when you get near the edge, it has a Rydberg series, just like hydrogen, 1s to 3p, 4p, 5p, et cetera, out into the continuum. And if you start tuning near this edge with your SASE pulses, you can see here in blue some SASE pulses. Um, what you can see is that um, when you're above the edge, uh, what you have is just basically emission from, from the ion. You've ionized the, the atom, and now you just have emission from the ion. But when you're below the edge, you can have this sort of stochastic scattering uh, when, when you're below this edge from, from the SASE pulses. And so there's a statistical argument that, oh, yes, we can, we can see this uh, stimulated X-ray Raman scattering. And there is a huge enhancement over the spontaneous Raman because the spontaneous Raman would have only yielded about 100 photons on the detector Whereas this, what they observed was, you know, was, was much higher. So we decided, oh, well, this would be a really, you know, all of, all of these propagation effects would be really interesting to, to investigate. And we, we went ahead and, and did some theory on this with the help of Meta Gard and her postdoc, Marie LeBay. Um, this actually follows on other work that was done previously by uh, Gail Mukhanoff and his colleagues and uh, Nina and her student Clemens Rent Wenninger. Um, what's different for, uh, in our work just to calculate what happens when you take this intense x-ray beam and send it through uh, gas is that it's actually a 3D code and now this 3D code runs on the Argon supercomputer. Um, and so what, what, what did we actually do? Um, so we basically uh, solved um, the Maxwell wave equation in forward propagation and treated the, the atoms inside the gas uh, with time-dependent Schrodinger equation. We used these um, uh, various energy levels, both for the, the neutral neon and for the neon plus. And we could just calculate, you know, what happens. We would mar space march through through this uh, through the gas um, with uh, with an input pulse, and you can see very interesting things happen. So so you can look at how this pulse gets reshaped, just sending it through this gas, right? You can compare different propagation distances. And so what, what's shown here on the top is what happens to the signal in the time domain. And what's shown here on the bottom is what happens in the spectral domain. 
So in the time domain, this is showing coming in with a point, uh, 250 out of second pulse. And what comes out is, is, is in red. So in blue and red for, for propagating at uh, half a centimeter, one and three centimeters. And what you can see is that um, you start to get these uh, fast beatings. Uh, and these are due to the presence of the stimulated Raman component. Um, and uh, so if you look on the spectral domain, maybe it's a little bit easier to see. You come in with this broad Gaussian pulse. You have the resonant absorption for the 1s to 3p. This is the absorption for the continuum here. And here is the stimulated Raman um, uh, the, in, in the neutral that we're talking about. And so you can keep going uh, as, as it develops. You can also take a look to see what happens when you're at uh, as a function of intensity, and you can see that there are all kinds of other features that happen, especially when you get to high intensity. You get all these weird things happening, uh, perhaps due to an X-ray dressed atom. So now, so we felt like we had to have this so that we could go ahead and go do an experiment and actually analyze what we had. So you know, the experiment is very simple. Um, of course, it requires the XFEL, <laughs> which is not so simple, but the experiment itself is very simple. So you have your X-rays coming in. There's actually an electron time of flight array that you can look at, at um, the spectrum uh, coming through. It goes through a gas attenuator, gets focused into the gas cell. It's then dispersed onto a 2D detector. So you would come in with your instant SASE pulses. You'd go out, you'd see some coming through still from the SASE pulse and then something else coming, coming through as well. So, you know, how simple it looks on paper, how simple it is in concept, it's actually really tricky, like all things um, in, in reality here is uh, the installation of the gas cell, you know, basically a year or so ago by our collaborators uh, from the Max Planck Institute in, in Heidelberg. And uh, prior to the experiment, of course, you know, oh, it's written here as a VLS and a 2D detector, but actually it's a pretty complicated um, Viking spectrometer and this needed uh, several weeks to actually um, um, be uh, uh, commissioned and, and focused and whatnot. So it was really quite quite uh, quite a lot of work for our you know four or five days of beam time. Um, but we got lots of results, right? And so we were looking at uh, propagation in a dense neon gas over this range. Uh, the edge for the 1S to continuum is at 870 EV, so it's kind of in between here. We could scan these SASE pulses, observe the transmitted intensity as a function of photon energy, X-ray intensity, gas pressure. Uh, this is just a, a quick picture of what, what we could see. These pulses were mighty fine pulses. They were three millijoules with maybe 70 EV bandwidth, uh, some pulse duration not measured. The fact that we had 2D imaging allowed us to monitor the spectral reshaping as spatial reshaping as well as spectral reshaping. And this is something that's quite important. Um, even though we only were acquiring data at 10 Hertz, in 30 minutes, you can get 18,000 shots. And so that's a lot of shots. Um, so we collected lots and lots of data on various targets. Um, here we have just a little map for just the neon targets that we looked at. Uh, this is as a function of pressure. Um, this is as a function of intensity um, from the FEL, and um, let's see, and this is a, as a function of photon energy. So we, we, we didn't map out the whole cube, but we did, we did quite a bit. And, we, and you can look at propagation effects when you have the high, high density uh, in, your, in your system, but you can also go to low density and look at single atom response at these super high intensity. So it was all, it was all very interesting in many ways. I just wanna show you today, um, looking at how we can do the stimulated Raman scattering using this propagation. So using this covariance analysis, we can get this high resolution X-ray Raman spectra. This is a simulation of 16, uh, Six the 6,000 spectra after 10 millimeters of propagation shown in this paper uh, below. And if you do the covariance analysis, you can see that you can see this um, Raman line for the 1s to 3p, 4p, et cetera. Uh, this, is, this type of analysis is actually used quite often um, in, in, in AMO physics, I guess, often for uh, 
ion electron uh, type um, um, uh, experiments, but is obviously also useful here. Um, here, the spectral resolution is basically determined by the spectral coherence of the SASE pulses, inversely proportional to the pulse duration. And so what we were able to do is we were able actually to see all these things as well as the X, the um, X-ray laser. So we had a covariance map. Um, we could see the uh, stimulated Raman scattering shown here for the 1S uh, to 3P in the neon over here. Well, it's maybe hard to see on this color scale, but there's also the 1S to 4P. We could see the X-ray laser. We had this directional scattering signal. We see the anomalous dispersion. The Raman line width was quite small, so we we're that was that was quite good. Um, you couldn't really see if you saw this in a line out. The resonant enhancement didn't look Lorentzian like I showed you in the earlier um, simulations for the argon because we're looking at absorption through this transmission geometry, and the background is not so smooth. So we were wondering about this background not being so smooth and how we could maybe improve the background. And so because we have this thing running on, on the supercomputer, we can actually calculate what, what we think we should see. And so this is taking a look at the covariance between the transmitted signal, the SASE signal, and the Raman scattered signal at the two different uh, photon energies. The Raman is around 850 and, and the incident is around uh, 870. And so this is the covariance for um, transmitted versus transmitted signal. But you can see that it gets quite a bit cleaned up for the incident versus uh, the tran transmitted signal. So if we actually had a measure of the incident spectrum versus um, uh, also a very high resolution, then we could actually do this covariance instead, and we'd have a cleaner background. So. There is a question as, oh, well, how well, why why don't we characterize this incident sassy spectrum, right? And so we actually did previous to all this, um, we we made this uh, uh, gaseous beam splitter based on photoelectron spectroscopy and, and implemented a ghost imaging algorithm so we could reconstruct the incident spectrum. Um, this is actually published earlier this year in communication physics. And you know, so basically the idea is that. Um, the photoelectron spectra encode the incoming photon spectrum uh, just with a shift due to the binding energy of the um, of the shell that you're that you're liberating in. And so we were able to do this here. And so now I'm breaking, but I think I'm kind of out of time. So <laughs> I'm breaking for questions here. So we'll just ask one question so that you can finish the talk. Um, so in the in the SASE pulses, so like in, in the simulations that you showed, you the, the simulations are all done with clean pulses, um, but the experiments, of course, are done with these SASE pulses. So in the SASE pulses, is there coherence between the different temporal or spectral peaks, or and does it matter? Um, like how how straightforward is it to translate like the results from the simulations with the clean 250 attosecond pulses to these messy uh, SASE right, pulses. Right. So, so actually we do simulations on messy SASE pulses also. So we've done, and, and that's why we have to do it on the supercomputer because you can do one simulation, right? And the one simulation might take you a day on, on your normal cluster. But to do, you know, thousands of simulations to build up the covariance map, with SASE pulses, this takes a long, long time. Um, and so we actually do it with SASE pulses. Um, so these, these things I showed you here, these were done with SASE pulses. These are simulations um, with SASE pulses. Mm. And it's, it's actually very tricky. I mean, they're not perfect yet, and they're not perfect yet because the SASE pulses that we simulated are not exactly replicating the SASE pulses that are really coming in. And the SASE pulses that are really coming in are, kind, are, are not, I would say, perfectly measured in, in our geometry. So our geometry was this, right? So this particular grading spectrometer operating in whatever, seventh or eighth order here, did not have perfect um, uh, energy resolutions, right? And so you couldn't really... Um, pick out all the spectral spikes. The re energy resolution of this spectrometer was only on the order 
of maybe 0.2 EV or so, mm -hmm. but the spikes might have been like 0.1 EV, so you couldn't quite get them all. And so it's actually very tricky to get the right statistical description of the SASE pulses to completely um, uh, reproduce uh, the covariance maps that we actually measure. So I would I would say it's tricky, and that's what we're working on now with the supercomputer. But we're well, I would say I'm I'm very frustrated with the supercomputer because you put in what you want, and then about um, two weeks or one month later, you get a little slot of time where they allow your thing to run. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's it's like it's torture, right? Oh, I want I want to look at this effect, this effect, this effect, and oh well, you know, a month later, <laughs> something comes out. So. Perhaps not quite as bad as an FEL, but well, no, no, this is terrible. Okay, so look, what let's see. Come, come, come. The, all of this data, well, all of the data that I showed you. Um, all of this data, this was collected in one hour. And all those other data that I showed you, you know, in that cube, all of that was collected in like three days. So, like, <laughs> but we're waiting months to get this, this running on the supercomputer. I would, I would have to say maybe it's, you know, it's because we didn't write a proposal for it and that we're kind of being fit in when there's not enough time, but there was a lot of um, effort that was expended such that we could get it to run in like six, um, a six hour time slot, um, such that it could maybe fit in between other things that were being run for a long time. So anyway, okay. All right, well, I'll let you continue. Okay, so I thought I would tell you a little bit about how we can actually try to characterize this SASE spectrum. Because if we could actually characterize the SASE spectrum, you know, very nicely and non-invasively, that would be great. And so this was what we were doing um, with those photoelectron spectrometers, right? And so here, what you, we can actually get a very simple and rapid calibration with enhanced spectral fidelity. So if I go back just a second, so this thing, here, this uh, electron time of flight array. This has 16 electron time of flight spectrometers arranged um, you know, uh, in this plane perpendicular to the propagation. And so originally these things were used primarily to uh, measure just the central photon energy that was coming through and also to measure the position of the beam coming through and to measure the polarization of, of, of of the beam. However, what we found was that you could actually also use it in this mode where you could, you could measure um, the energy spectrum, not just the centroid, but actually you know, these spikes to some degree, depending on how, how well resolved is your, your electron spectrum. And so when you do this, you can have, you have, we, Although there are 16 spectrometers, only six of them really show much signal in this dipole plane. And so you can look at those six and then you can um, collect the, uh, you're simultaneously collecting on a very high resolution spectrometer, uh, the actual photon spectrum. So this is your high resolution spectrum. Oops. This is your low resolution. Um, um, object spectrum, and between these two, you can you can do a mapping between the very high resolution spectrum and the and the low resolution spectrum. So this is what you observe, and clearly uh, what you see in this uh, in the low resolution so-called cookie box spectrum is a, a is a function of what the input, the true spectrum. And so then obviously the true spectrum can also be inverted by, by some response matrix. And the response matrix that you can calculate um, because every shot that you that you take gives you a realization of these two of these two different things, the spectrum and, and the response in, in the photoelectron spectrometer. And so you have a number of equations associated with how many shots you're looking at. You only have M unknowns, which are how many 
um, points you have for the um, uh, for the electron time of flight spectrometer. You can basically retrieve this response matrix by least squares regression. And that uh, what was shown here was for 15,000 shots. So for maybe 20 minutes worth of, of, of stuff. So here, what you can see is that if you just take the, for a single shot, the photon spectrum is shown here in red, the electron derived spectrum shown here in blue, they don't really match very well. But after you do this, uh, this um, uh, reconstruction with the response matrix, uh, you can actually, uh, you can actually reproduce what the photon spectrum looks like, you know, at some resolution. This was convolved with a, with a sigma of about 0.2 eV. And you can see that if you quantify the deviation from, from the spectra, from the ghost imaging spectrum relative to, to the raw spectrum, you can see that it's, in, that it's better by maybe a factor of two or so. So you have an improved match and you can get some sort of uh, reconstruction of the profile. Um, you can also see that if you use six ETOFs, it's better than one. This is the reconstruction using just one ETOF. This is using six ETOFs. You can see the reduction of this um, figure of merit uh, as you put in more ETOFs. But um, what's also very interesting is you can teach this um, array to predict shots that haven't, haven't been measured yet. So if you, if you take a look at this uh, figure of merit, after you have some learning shots, you can you can actually take a look at how how that how that increases. So, so the figure of merit is is, um, is very different when you only have about two thousand learning shots, but when you get out to about ten thousand or so, it's they've really converged very well. Now, now this is very useful because then you can you can after this training period where you're using the super high resolution photon spectrometer to train it. Um, you can you can then uh, reconstruct at high resolution uh, many shots. The only problem here was that the ETOF array that was being used was kind of short, kind of low resolution, but actually at the LCLS, the ETOF array has a potential for much, much improved resolution. It's, um, it has a three times longer uh, flight path, and so it could be super useful um, for the future. So let me just quickly summarize here. X-ray Raman scattering is really a powerful tool for site-specific electronic snapshots. Um, it hasn't really been realized in the X-ray regime so robustly just yet, but we have demonstrated now the stimulated Raman with high resolution, um, which might get, get toward nonlinear X-ray spectroscopies in the future. You know, these longer SASE pulses, which many people don't like, actually provide better resolution. We can have relatively short collection times uh, if you actually wanted to do these in, in the standard way where you monochromatize the FEL beam very, very down, down a lot and then, and then collected um, the high resolution spectrum, things take a pretty long time. Uh, we can enhance the signal to background if we have this instant spectrum normalization that I talked about with this uh, ghost imaging spectrometer. It's actually possible to extend to more complex uh, molecular systems. There is a very nice paper by Victor Kimberg in St Structural Dynamics in uh, 2019 that describes this. And, uh, and we have so much data that we look forward to understanding these propagation effects uh, with much more modeling and, and, and whatnot. And, and we have a number of additional experiments that have been done looking at temporal domain investigations with LCLS and out of second pulses and actually with an imaging X-ray emission spectrometer that actually was just installed uh, a few weeks ago at the European XFEL. There are many collaborators in, in, this, uh, in this endeavor. Um, folks at Argonne, I want to point out particularly my student Kai Lee, who's been uh, very uh, instrumental in, in all these things. Um, and Meta Gard and Marie LeBay, who've been doing the, uh, the theory. Um, at Max Planck Heidelberg, Thomas Pfeiffer, Christian Ott, and their group ha have supplied all that, um, uh, the very, the very uh, complex gas cell that's used there. 
uh, at Uppsala, they, they, they were supplying the um, uh, expertise associated with the emission and uh, spe spectroscopy. Um, uh, and Mark Sorbonne at Sorbonne, Mark, Mark Simone and uh, Maria Novella, uh, their, their, their general knowledge is, is always helpful. And at the European Expel, a number of collaborators, Tomaza Maza um, in particular, and, and Michelle Meyer, who organized everything. And at Slack, which I didn't tell you about, but this is for temporal domain um, reshaping. Uh, an experiment took place. We're still analyzing the data, but 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 many people are 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 um, are very key there. C. G. Lee, um, James Krein, Agil Marinel, Marinelli, and and, and Ming Fu Lin. I just show you quickly. The, these are this is a picture. <laughs> so this is how you conduct um, these experiments in the COVID age remotely. <laughs> this is this is myself and Kai and Jill Dumi from from our we're we're remote and and these are all our collaborators at the European Exfel um, who were who were who were there and and very happy. Um, this is Thomas Pfeiffer, Christian Knott, Michael Meyer, uh, Jan Eric Rubinson, and, and and so you know they're very happy. We have so much data. We have not started to analyze it. We, we have not completed analyzing it. We're, we're in various phases, but but it's super exciting. And um, you know, we always look for more collaborators on, on these things because it, it's kind of fun. So thank you for your attention. And any questions um, would be would be appreciated. Right. Okay. Thanks. So we've got a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so the, the first question is very general. So I'm wondering if you could kind of give a you know, a short overview of the, like the landscape of where FELs stand right now, what's on the horizon. And then like, you know, if you could wave a magic wand to produce any type of parameters that you wanted for these experiments, um, what would, you know, what would be needed to really uh, push this science further? Well, you know, the FELs are making um, uh, dramatic leaps forward now. Um, coming up are these higher rep rate uh, FELs that will also have these at a second pulses. Um, and so these are quite, um, I would say, they're quite anticipated, right? To have two color control of at a second pulses that can address independently different areas of you know your complex systems, that would be quite um, the uh, um, that would be quite the uh, the piece de resistance, and that's what they're working toward at at LCLS. Us, we're we're just trying to figure out. Oh well, can we use what we have <laughs> that doesn't require quite so much <laughs> tweaking, <laughs> and still get some information uh, from it? And and meanwhile, can we understand some of these unusual uh, propagation reshaping effects that are not dissimilar from what, for example, Donna Strickland was looking at, you know, a long time ago with optical pulses propagating through through matter. Um, but but I think in general that would be quite quite um, quite interesting to be able to have. The other thing that's really needed are better better detection capabilities. Um, right now you're really limited by how well you can um, do some of your experiments by the the relatively low rep rate of reading out two D X ray detectors. It's really quite, uh, it's, you know, it's quite, it's quite constraining, right? Because you don't always just want to have, you know, a 1D array in the spectral domain. You really want to have the whole shape that, that you're seeing. And now you're suddenly having 100 kilohertz, megahertz x-rays, but you don't have 100 megahertz cameras <laughs> or, or 1 megahertz cameras. Right? So, so that would be, those would be, um, uh, you know, very cool things. I would say I have I did not talk about seated FELs at all, and that is actually um, that is actually quite uh, those are actually quite amazing um, because not only are they seated, so they don't have this ugly structure. Because they're seated, they also have the perfect synchronization with the pump laser. And so because of that, you can really, you can imagine many things. There's only one of these seated uh, 
uh, FELs uh, so far. Uh, that's the one in um, Fermi at Trieste. Um, and uh, it's, it's, its drawback is that um, the seeded FELs don't go out to very high photon energies. They're you know, kind of limited. Um, but if you don't, if you only need a probe, you can use the higher harmonics of the FEL rather than the fundamental, and you can get out to higher photon energy. So, so I would say that, you know, there are many things that are, it's going in many directions simultaneously. <laughs> and, but, but I would have to say people are really, countries are really investing in these things. So there's a new one in China that will be easily as, um, um, easily as powerful as the LCLS, which is going for these megahertz rep rates at you know, high photon energy um, and with sharp pulses. So, you know, it, it's exploring. And so every, people like to explore. All right. Um, and then another question beyond spectroscopy, is there any prospect of using XFELs for other applications? So for example, for uh, microscopy or lithography or uh, something else? Oh yeah, I only talked about spectroscopy because I thought this was sort of a seminar-ish type thing <laughs> as opposed to like the grand everything. But yes, um, okay. So what else do people do with FELs besides spectroscopy? The thing that they mostly do with FELs is serial femtosecond crystallography. So this is in the biological range. And so the initial dream for FELs was, oh gosh, can I, because I have 1 trillion photons in a very short time, can I do a diffract and destroy experiment and obtain the structure of a, of a huge complex molecule um, before it gets damaged? And so this is a huge, um, I would say, driver. So biology is a really, really big thing uh, with, with FELs. And so that's diffraction. There's also um, basically molecular movies that are also done by diffraction. And so what you can do is, again, you can have some activating pulse, some activating optical pulse, and then you can scatter uh, X-rays uh, from your excited um, molecule. You can do this in the gas phase. Um, and so people have looked at the ring opening reaction, for example, for cyclohexatriene, and they can actually see how they can watch the um, atomic uh, coordinates uh, as that, um, as that, uh, as that process unfolds. And they were able to deduce something about how the orbital symmetries were, were evolving after this uh, optical excitation. So I would say that's a huge driver is, um, is uh, basically molecular movies by diffraction. Um, then one, one last question. Um, so in, in optical, with optical lasers, when your light source becomes too coherent, um, you typically run into laser speckle issues. So this is uh, used for example, in speckled ultrasound imaging. Mm -hmm. um, is are there similar challenges in the X-ray regime? Yeah, people also like to use speckle in the X-ray regime, and people do use it. Um, so they use it in photon correlation spectroscopies. So in photon correlation spectroscopies, um, basically they can use um, speckle to watch the dynamics of uh, of the systems and uh, and people have been using that basically speckle visibility spectroscopy um, to look at uh, basically dynamics in water and, and other things like that. I mean it's it's something that again um, requires better x-ray detectors. <laughs> It's, uh, but it's, but you know, so if you have a speckle pattern and you have a short X-ray pulse, you get one speckle pattern, but if things have moved around and you have uh, another spectral um, pattern with a longer X-ray pulse, you have something else and you can do something uh, about um, the dynamics this way. Okay, um, so that's, that's it for, um today's presentation then. Thank you so much, Linda, for, for coming to give the seminar. Um, we will have a, another presentation in two weeks on Friday, December 16th, um, which will be given by Hannes Bernian from University of Chicago. Um, so 
I, I look forward to seeing everyone then. And again, thanks. Thanks so much, Linda. Thank you for the invitation. <laughs>